I'm Andrew Brace. Welcome to the second in the series of Yukonuba and Dog World Breeders Masterclasses from the finals of the Yukonuba Champion Stakes at Stoneley in the heart of England. Today's topic is what makes a world-class dog breeder? I would like to welcome our audience and our distinguished panel. I'm sure we will have some interesting discussion and I'll be inviting questions from the audience. So let me start by introducing our panel. Anne MacDonald has travelled down from Scotland. Although never considering herself a large-scale breeder, Anne's Mabruka Salukis have enjoyed tremendous success in the show ring. Anne is convener of the Scottish Kennel Club and sits on various Kennel Club committees. Welcome, Anne. Zena Thorne Andrews' Drakesleet Kennel needs no introduction. She has broken many records with her Irish Wolfhounds and miniature wirehair Dachshunds and is also the UK's top-ranked all-rounder judge, awarding challenge certificates in all our recognised breeds. Thank you for joining us, Zena. <laughs> Harry O'Donoghue is one of Ireland's most celebrated dog breeders and judges. His Blackdale Wire Fox Terriers, in particular, being famous around the globe. Harry has been breeding various terriers and other breeds most of his adult life and is a board member of the Irish Kennel Club. Harry, welcome. Thank you. Thank you Michael Gadsby is one of the UK's most successful and versatile breeders and exhibitors. Originally best known for his afterglow American Cocker Spaniels, he has also achieved huge success with poodles and Afghan hounds, as well as titling dogs in many other breeds. He is, of course, the breeder and handler of the dog who last year represented the UK at the Yukonuba World Challenge in California, Donny, the white standard poodle, otherwise known as champion and American champion, afterglow the big T's. Thank you for your participation, Mike. Thank you. I'll start off the questions by asking each of our panellists, at what point did you actually consider yourself a dog breeder rather than just a dog owner or exhibitor? What made you decide to breed and where did you go for advice? Zena, perhaps you'd like to answer first. Ah. Um. Difficult question. I can't remember ever thinking I'm now a dog breeder. But I guess um, to take it a little further, I think I, I really felt I'd arrived and I'd got my own strain when I mated my own homebred champion dog to my own homebred champion bitch. And then I felt I was part of the dog world. Good answer. Anne, I know that you were virtually born into the sport, weren't you? Well, not quite. Um, I've never really considered myself a dog breeder, as, as you know, um, having bred so few litters. Um, I've only ever gone in, down the road of breeding when I've wanted a new dog for myself to, to show. Um, so I suppose I'm not quite in Zena's class. I feel um, probably the answer to um, when I considered myself a breeder was when I had successfully bred my second litter and reared and sold the puppies. But your mother actually had quite my an involvement mother had in the sport. She did. Um, my background um, is, uh, my father's side of the family are all farmers and bred and exhibited pedigree cattle. Um, my mother started in the 50s uh, breeding and exhibiting Pembroke Corgis. So I learnt a lot about dog shows, exhibiting and breeding at the same time as she did. Um, so I have... Were you and a that junior was, handler? I, I, well, in days <laughs> when, you, when it was called children's handling, and handling had not, be a, not, these days. not a lot to do with <laughs> professional handling. What about Harry? When did you feel <coughs> that you were actually a dog breeder? About five years after I started in dogs, I had a couple of litters that were in those five years and they were all very bad. I showed them and I couldn't understand why I couldn't win. I only realised they were so poor. When I look at some of the photographs now, I am disgusted that I even owned them. 
<laughs> and after about five years, I thought I knew a little bit about dogs, and I decided I'd have to get something better. And the best way to breed good ones was to try and get a couple of decent bitches, which was very difficult in those days. I speak about 1958. I started in 53, so about 58, I got started in something decent. And then I considered myself a breeder, uh, or uh, let's say an amateur breeder by then, to try and breed something good. But what I had before that were hopeless. Well, you've obviously improved. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael, when did you actually start looking at yourself as a breeder? Um, well, I started um, uh, working a, as a, a kid in a Pyrenean kennel, and she was a breeder. And then I had mentors who were in Shih Tzus and uh, Spaniels. So my introduction to the dog world was through breeders. So I think that before I became a breeder, I think the mentality was as a breeder. And so consequently, the first dog I actually owned and showed, I bred myself. And um, so I think basically I've always been interested in breeding. There's been times in my life when I've not been able to breed because of work commitments and and you know not being able to have the number of dogs but I think as a as a serious breeder when uh, when we actually entered a business which was a boarding kennel which allowed me to do that and then it became almost like an obsession to breed really great dogs so <laughs> no one ever would have noticed my God. <laughs> <clears throat> we're now going to ask the audience for some questions so <clears throat> who would like to kick off Gentleman there in the middle. My name is Keith Young. I'm from Royal Leamington Spa here in Warwickshire. My main breed is Golden Retrievers. And I'd like to ask the panel, you've all been very successful in your own breed or breeds. To what would you contribute your success as a breeder? Harry, there's one for you. To what do you owe this great success? A little bit of knowledge and a lot of luck. I think that you can be a breeder for half a lifetime and not hit it. And I think luck comes into it quite a bit. I, you, you do need some knowledge, but you also need a breeding stock. Uh, it's not much sense trying to breed something very good from two very bad ones. That doesn't work. It certainly didn't work for me anyway. So success is some knowledge of the breed and a little bit of mathematics in trying to decide which dog is the right dog for that particular bitch or vice versa as the case may be. But luck comes into it. You can breed two good ones together and produce not so good of puppies. I would firmly believe it's uh, some knowledge and a lot of luck. The luck of the Irish. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, ma it helps. And you've already <coughs> explained that you've never considered yourself to be a large-scale breeder, yeah. but, but the limited amount of breeding you've done has resulted in great success in the show ring. Mm -hmm. So to what do you attribute that? Well, in the first instance, when I decided I wanted to go into Salukis and own a Saluki, um, I had time uh, between deciding on the breed and actually buying one. Um, so I s did a lot of study learnt as much as I could about the breed. Um, I went to a kennel whom I could see were pr consistently producing top class dogs, not just for themselves, but for other people. So I had got my pick of litter from Hope Waters Berry Down Kennel, which uh, I started off with. Um, I think it's uh, crucial to have the very best stock to begin with. It saves a lot of time. Um, you have to be a ruthless critic of your own dogs <coughs> because unless you acknowledge where the faults lie in your own stock, you're never going to progress. Um, I think you have to have skill in choosing the right mate for your bitches. You have to have quite a different skill in being able to pick the right puppy out of the resulting litter. And as Harry said, you have to have an enormous amount of luck, and I've been very lucky. Did you have luck as well, Zena? Um, not entirely down to luck. I think I, I can remember joining the Irish Wolfhound Club, which was my first breed in 1965. And it took me two years and I looked around the country and saw several litters before I managed to pick, pick a puppy. 
And, and in that two years beforehand, I'd asked all the breeders, I'd watched, I'd learnt. I read a lot of books, I'm a great reader. And uh, that dog was lucky enough to become the top wolfhound for four years, and I went on from there. So I don't think it's all down to luck. I think you have to have a single-minded minded determination that, you know, you want to give something to that breed and you, you just focus on it. Um, I think you've got to have the ability to never stop learning and reading books is a very good way of carrying that on and also you must learn about construction if you don't have any idea of what a good shoulder is or a good back end or a perfect top line for whatever breed um, you're never going to progress so I think get some books on construction movement learn the basics first before you think of going wholeheartedly into breeding Michael, um, I think one of the one of the biggest uh, attributes to arriving at what you want to achieve is to just have a pure vision. You've got to be able to almost picture in your mind what you want to achieve, and then it becomes a little easier. You can't have you can't take personalities into selection processes when you're trying to breed good dogs you know if you hate somebody or you didn't like you know this this all of that has got to be taken out of it and i think that one of the simplest ways if you're interested in dogs and i think it's sometimes really important that you actually look across lots of breeds it's if somebody's been really successful it's easy to just have a look, work out what pedigrees they were using, what dogs they've been line breeding to. And in, if you started out, one of the easiest ways is just to emulate somebody that's been successful and then go from there. And obviously you've got to understand construction. You, and, and one of the most important things really is to be able to pick out puppies at an early age. There's not many people who can run on puppies until they're six or seven, seven months old. So I think there's a skill where that's involved. But I do agree... Um, at the look part of it and I think that sometimes something drops into your into your lap you've got to be able to to see that that's an opportunity and run with it do you think people have an instinctive eye yes I think um, I mean a few years ago we a, a bitch a very 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 important bitch in the States was this is American Cockers was um, offered to three breeders in this country before she was offered to me and the reason the other breeders didn't have her was because she was older. And I, th I guess they thought that, you know, by the time she'd done her quarantine and, and come into the country, she would perhaps only be able to have perhaps one more litter. Um, that bitch was the litter sister of... Sorry, that bitch's mother was the litter sister of the top dog in the States at the time. And she herself had, like, 21 siblings that were champions. And I couldn't believe the opportunity that I had when I was when it eventually she arrived, being offered to me, and she produced um, Ambrose and Arabella and was top brood bitch all breeds. So she was, um, but that was luck, you know. But then you know you can either look at it from a <coughs> negative point of view. Oh, she's older, so she's she's you know her, right. her value is you know. Grab the opportunities. Let's have another audience question. My name is Tony Teasdale and I'm from Surrey and my main breed is Affen Pinchers but I also have Bearded Collies. Um, I'd just like to ask the panel, what are the key things you need to consider as a successful breeder? Uh, it, as far as I am concerned, what my kennel is, um, the most important thing that one is the quality of the animal you must keep. You understand? You must keep a decent animal. There's no point in running on uh, inferior quality stock. That's number one. The second thing is then, it has to be cared for and nourished and trained and walked and whatever the place is, as this needs to be done to it on a daily basis. To expect it to flourish on its own free will, lying in the field or running around, it doesn't happen. It has to have constant contact and have an association with its owner or who's, who's going to be the the eventual handler. Let's hope that's going to happen. But the actual uh, physical uh, method of doing that depends entirely on what facilities is available within your home or your kennel, right? And the actual husbandry, as far as I'm concerned, is one is 
feeling is of extreme importance. Of extreme importance. I've seen some horrendous things happen with people mm, with their methods of feeding, dogs going all wrong. Uh, that's very important, Bon, is they have to be fed properly and encouraged from a young age that they're going to be a show dog, if that's what you want them to be. You know, there's many young animals come on the scene and they never reach the ring. <coughs> people may not want them to reach the ring, they may want them to become a brood this or a stud dog, whatever it may be. But um, the, the physical element of the husbandry end is feeding, housing and association with the owner. That's the three principal things that I have from my youngsters coming on. I hope that answers your question. Well, it's obviously served you very well, Harry. <coughs> Zena, what would be your thoughts on that? I totally agree with Harry, um, but I would add to that, um, the conditions which you keep your dogs is really important. How many times have you seen people arriving at a show with their big pickup or whatever, and there's this poor banged about dog in the back, sat on a bit of shredded up newspaper, and it's probably done several hours in the car. I believe in giving my dogs every comfort. They go out, they, they're exercise, they've got muscles on their muscles, but you've got to care for them too. If you want a dog to come to a show in a, in a good state of mind, it's got to be looked after on the way there. It has to have the prop, proper food in its stomach to give it that extra oomph. It's got to have a gleaming, gleaming coat. Cond conditions everything, and as, as partly as a judge as well, there's no end of dogs that have been possibly top brushed and underneath there are probably a bag of bones. Sur their coats surface are grooming. Their, yeah, their coats, their coats are matted underneath. <coughs> and in fact, I can remember at Cruft several years ago doing petite bassets and I had a bitch in limit that I placed very highly. And I said to the owner, I said, oh, you haven't groomed the legs. And he said, oh, I must have missed a leg. I said, you missed them all. <laughs> and it was a most fantastic petite. And I said to Michael afterwards, I said, if you want a certain champion, you ought to go and buy that. And it was a scruffiest looking individual. And he made it up in about four shows, I yeah, think. Yeah, she did, yeah. So there you go. So presentation, there's not that many judges are going to forgive bad <coughs> grooming, bad presentation, bad coat condition, or bad body. And muscle, to me, proves everything in a dog, if, is a dog looked after at home. Interesting observations. I'd like to address now perhaps something um, a little bit uh, more as far as the um, actual breeding <coughs> principles are concerned. So if we're talking about um, your philosophy, for want of a better word, on breeding, I'm going to ask all four of you, um, beginning <coughs> with uh, Michael, uh, to what extent do you determine matings based on the physical properties of a dog and bitch? And how much are you influenced by pedigree, the paperwork? Well, initially I thought that it was all about pedigrees and line breeding and, and all of that. But the reality is um, that I think that the physical attributes of the parents are the most important and I think that we go back to pedigrees to check out that there's nothing in there that we don't like or indeed that we're not going too close <coughs> because you know because in the past I've you know I've thought perhaps with the poodles oh that dog would be perfect for that bitch and then when I've looked I've thought no 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 that's just too close and so we've had to make um, you know we've had to change our views on what stud dog we were going to use but basically I think that you know, when you consider the genetics and the DNA, it's if you're just doing on pedigrees and the physical animals don't become less important, it, you know, getting a really great dog's like winning the lottery because of the, the combinations that can go, you know, when putting two animals together. So I think you're far more, I, I think it's far more likely that you'll get good animals if the physical attributes of the parents are the number one priority. And complimentary, presumably. Yes, so yes, of course. And what did you have to say about that? I were, breed were you, totally. Were you a dog yeah. and bitch breeder rather than a paperwork breeder? Very much so. Um, my initial selection of a, do of a dog was always based on its physical property to start with. Then, and, and finally, the, the last decision I take is on that as well. Um, obviously you check the pedigree as Mike said. 
Um, you also, I also want to see if he's a dog that's been used before, just what virtues he passes on to his progeny. Um, I think that's important as well. Um, if you keep within your lines, pedigree wise, I think you're more likely to maintain the good qualities you already have. You don't risk losing them so easily. And um, I think dogs which are similar to look at <coughs> um, are gen also genetically similar because um, it's obviously the gene that comes through in the particular feature that that dog carries. Um, and we all know um, a pedigree um, is the same for the best puppy in the litter and the worst puppy in the litter. The pedigree is exactly the same. So it's actually the selection of the genes in the good dog that you're looking for. Oh. So physical properties. Harry, if we um, threw that question at you, I mean, your pedigrees must be something to be seen to be believed because they're probably all five generations solid black tail, I would think, by now. How do you feel about the, the mating of complementary animals versus pretty paperwork? Well, Mike hit it on the head. <clears throat> I don't particularly look deeply into the paperwork. There's not much sense in having a fantastic pedigree and look at the dog and say, where did he come from? Oh, there's five generations of champions, but the dog's no good. I'd much prefer to have a hell of a good dog, but not so many champions. So, Mike hit it on the head and said that, that the physical properties of the dogs are very important when you go to breed. And the pedigree is a nice plus. If it happens to have a very fancy pedigree, well and good. I bred many, many good dogs and neither Sire nor Dam were champions. Neither Sire nor Dam were champions. And for that matter, many of them, the grandparents may not have been champions. Why I, many of my dogs happen to have the same prefix right through is that I live in Ireland. And with the exception of three dogs, one of which was an English dog, all the dogs that I've ever used are all my own, so which stem down from three dogs way back. One of those dogs did come from England, and the others have all been Irish dogs and all descendants from mine. I have three different bloodlines run through my kennels and that's why everything is black tail right through the way. But to get back to the kernel of the question is what do I think about pedigrees and the physical properties of the sires and dams? I go for the shape of the sire and the shape of the dam. Will it work? I have a look at the pedigree. It should work on the pedigree and then I go for it. Seems I, to, seems seems to be a sort of pretty consistent opinion there. Are you going along with that, Zena? Or are yes, you very much so. Yeah. Yes, um, I'd say something like about eighty percent the dog, and about twenty percent I will have a look at the pedigree, make sure I'm not gone too close or doubled up too much, and um, I try always not to double up on the fault. I think it can take you generations to get out. You make two dogs that, however lovely they are, with perhaps long hocks or straighter shoulders than they should have, you'll have the very devil of a job to breed them out. And um, so I, I go more on, on trying to mate, not dogs of opposite type, because I too have got three families running in my lines, and I've had now 17 generations of champions in a direct line. And I just believe in mating the best to the best and having a look at the pedigree, but not, not going too mad about pedigree mm -hmm. if we can come back can, to can I just say something yeah sure that in the past I was just thinking about it in the past because I think when you're inexperienced perhaps pedigrees and you know you look in the books and there's these great dogs and you think oh my god if only I could have bred to this and what have you and you know American cockers have been fortunate to have quite a few imports well a lot of imports some are good some have been very bad but in the past I've used very bad <coughs> imports just purely on the on the virtue of they've got very good pedigree so there's been a dog in there that I've, been, I've particularly admired and did it work no not at all so <laughs> there you go thank you for that admission. that's okay okay if we just come back a little bit to management now um when it comes to to nutrition you've all mentioned nutrition briefly do you tend to feed puppy stud dogs and nursing bitches differently um, and, and if so, if, if you could just explain a little, a bit, little about your sort of feeding regime, have your feeding methods changed, Michael? Um, I, you have to, obviously, if you're going to 
like these animals are going to have um, the best chance. You've got to feed the the best possible food you can. And I've fed, um, you know, lots of different products over the years to the point where I'm now very satisfied with what we feed. And um, I actually, uh, I know this is the Yukonuba Masterclass, but we do. I do feed Yukonuba, and um, yeah, well, I do, and we have fantastic results from it. And the only thing that we do different across the range, a range of, of varying um, you know, adults and puppies. Obviously the puppies are on puppy food, the adults are on the adult food and we give our bitches that are um, feeding puppies the puppy food and it all seems to go swimmingly well. Right, Zena? Um, well my feeding regimes have changed over the years because back when I started there were no complete foods at all and I used to spend hours cutting up meat and tripe and mincing it and going down to the docks and getting slightly damaged fresh fish and cooking that all up. I used to spend hours with, with the food and then mixing up um, a different type, of just a plain biscuit with it. But these days we've got it so much easier and foods like Yukonuba and the other high quality brands um, have given us a lot, a lot more time in a way. Um, I still add things to my food. I add a certain amount of meat or tripe or fish. Um, nursing bitches and puppies, they might get scrambled eggs and vegetables. Um, stud dogs get the same regardless as everybody else. Um, but I do think it's, it's important to tailor your food to the dog. I mean, nothing should get so many ounces per se. If a, if a dog needs more, it should have more. If a, if a dog gets fat on a, the diet it's supposed to have, then cut it down. Sure, sure. Harry, uh, did you feel that scientific <coughs> advances in dog nutrition has influenced the way that you feed over the years? And it's a lot of years. Yes. I first started, like, you know, with tripe, which is a very good food. Uh, it's not a complete food. Tripe and all the biscuit of the day at that time it was messy and smelly. Certainly wasn't very welcome around the house, or certainly, particularly inside the house. Uh, at any time, irrespective of how well you clean the tribe. <laughs> it was quite a, a, a sniff off yourself as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> here, here. But it was good food and the dogs liked it. Even fussy eaters would have a go for tribe. It was messy. And over the years, uh, new extruded foods were developed. And without a doubt, we've come to a stage now in the past number of years of having some fantastic ones on the market, including Yukonuba. Uh, there are others as well. At present, I feed uh, superior quality food uh, and a particularly high level protein food to the puppies, to the stud dogs, to the show dogs. They all get the same food and the brood bitches. The old members of the kennel get a, a lesser quality food and there's many in the kennel at present 10 and 12 years old. but. Uh, they get a, a lower protein and fat element. But I feed one food to all the others, show dogs included. Gentleman in the Cerulean show, <laughs> I believe. <coughs> Good morning, my name is Jason Higgins from Castleford in Yorkshire, and we have Griffin Brusselois and Border Collies. And my question to the panel is, do you take note of what show winners, for instance, best in show at Crufts, are fed, and does this influence you? Are you influenced by what one best in show Crofts might do? No. <laughs> You're more influenced by what one reserve best in show, I would imagine. I've had a reserve best in show. <laughs> two. How, How could we two? ever forget? <laughs> How could we ever forget? <laughs> Harry? No. Anne? No. Well, there you are, Jay. <laughs> there, there, is, there is your answer. And I noticed another, another few hands up there. Lisdon Hill, Nottinghamshire. My main breeds are Rottweilers, Japanese Shiba Inus and soft coated Wheaton Terriers. I would like to ask the panel, at what age do you select your best puppies? Do you differentiate between puppies you may wish to keep for showing and for breeding? A very interesting and deep question from Mrs. Dunhill. <coughs> Anne. <laughs> right, well. Did you differentiate between? I have never differentiated between puppies I wanted to show or because all my litters have been bred for the purpose of creating another show dog for myself. Um, 
I tend to select at between six and eight weeks. Um, the puppies are more balanced in construction at that age. They, after six weeks, they start to grow Large up the way. Yes, mm. um, they develop knobbly knees with the, and, and one thing and another. Um, and you're best not to look at them again until they're about five months old. Um, so I do make my selection at six to eight weeks. Um, I think that answers the question. Harry, when do you decide that uh, something's going to stay and do you differentiate between something that you keep as breeding stock or, or, or a show dog? No, I don't differentiate between breeding stock and show stock. If it's a show, well, it's kept. I look at all the puppies at eight weeks. I don't put them on the table before eight weeks. I let them feed away, feed them very well. And at eight weeks, they, I look at them and make a decision at eight weeks which ones I like. If I like one, I keep that one. I don't look at him again until he's four months old. You know, he will get some little bit of training, whatever it might be on a lead, but at four months, he stays. If I like him at eight weeks, he stays. At four months, I look at him again. If I like him, then he stays. That's it. Michael, what about you? <coughs> well, um, it's slightly different for me because we, as an American cocker breeder, it's slightly different for the breeds, but as an American cocker breeder, we're trying to um, develop particulars with some of the attributes that um, we have in our solid lines. And in doing so, if you mate across the colours, the first generation, you don't get any particulars. You get some whole colours and you get some mismarks. And so we have uh, selected and kept mismarked puppies because they've been the best in the litter so you know so that's that's obviously for and then those puppies they on the next generation when bred to a particle they produce mismarks and 100 percent particles which then breed pure so these hybrids whether or not they're mismarked are very very important for the future um and then like in 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 the standard poodle litter that produced Donny, there was his sister, a very very good bit. She had a, a naturally duck tail, um, which was only like two inches long, so it wasn't even enough to to be able to create a tail with. So, but she was um, a beautiful bit. She's produced very well, and um, so I kept her because of that. But generally, but if you go back to just picking out a, generally a puppy for for the show ring again between seven and eight weeks i think is the the time that most people agree i think is everybody it, agrees they're pretty much in balance there, yes right? that's what about right you, Zina? I mean, when do you um, make the selection? eight weeks on the dot on the dot yeah <laughs> I'm, i i always feel i'm not very good at selecting puppies before then and after eight weeks they do tend to start growing up or up at the back or up at the front wolfhounds certainly do and um <coughs> But there again, when you've got a kennel type, you tend to produce perhaps not one stunning dog and a, and a load of pet puppies. You tend to produce a more even litter. And in that case, I feel, feel I have to run on possibly sometimes three in the litter um, to see what I think about when the teeth change and things like that. But eight weeks is, is if I'm looking for other people and they bring a litter for me to see, I always insist on them to the day. If they and, can. And, and do you differentiate in, in any way between something that might be kept for breeding that wasn't perhaps showable? Uh, not in my breeds, no. Um, but I can see that a lot of the toy breeds would have to perhaps uh, keep a bigger bitch for, to, to breed and not to have caesareans. So I can well see that some breeds would need that. They, what oh I was going to say was, I, think, I, I do think that like six, five, six week old puppies are often also in balance. As, they're probably as in balance as when they're eight weeks old. But psychologically, you, they're, they're difficult to assess because if you try to stack them on a table, they aren't. They've not been handled enough. That like everything's new to them. So that they, you know, you can have a puppy at five weeks old that you look at and it can. You can think, oh god, this is dreadful. It's you know the top. You know, it's got a roach back. It's, and the same puppy in two weeks' time, with a little bit more handling. It's relaxed and 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 it it looks fabulous. So, well, do, I, do, but do, I think do, that you can. I, th I think it, occasionally you get puppies that are very much younger, that just have this attitude that, that they feel very good about themselves, and you can actually see a lot. But uh, do, do you feel that it's necessary to stack a, a, a dog at that age, or wouldn't you prefer to see it just running both free in <coughs> the yard? No, no, I think both. I think it's important to. Uh, I mean, and the thing is with like American cockers, you can 
well in, in fact most breeds you can pull sort of dogs manipulate them into a great shape don't be giving away too many tips to cycle <laughs> no but the point is it's that, that's one thing that I've learned to my detriment at t- times in the past because you could make a puppy look really good but of course when they move they revert back to the, you know not what, so good yes <laughs> and so consequently when I put a puppy on the table I don't ever try and do that I just pop them on the table and just see how they stand naturally because you know that's that's the most important feature. I think Rosalie Brady had a very interesting question. My name is Rosalie Brady. I'm from North Yorkshire and I've had papillons and now have flat-coated retrievers. Just recently there's been a lot of exposure um, about the importance of health and lack of exaggeration. Has this in any way affected your outlook for your future breeding plans? Harry. This is definitely one for you, and I can almost <laughs> anticipate the answer. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> um, I'm quite sure these people have ideas in their heads about what they would like and what they wouldn't like. But I also have ideas after 55 years' experience. And I feel that my experience in, in what I'm doing is the correct experience. Not maybe perfectly correct, but correct as far as I'm concerned. And I don't see why anybody should tell me now that my dogs are not what they want, if you like. I feel that in the breed that I'm in, there are very little problems in the breed. Uh, There was a little problem some years ago, but that has more or less, well certainly has diminished if not gone altogether. So, as far as I'm concerned, I'm continuing the way I've always done it. And uh, until I see a problem arise in the breeder, I might think about changing. But at present, I'm not changing. So it's uh, business as usual at Blackdale, I would imagine. (laughs) So, um, Zena. Well, I'm afraid I've got to disagree with Harry as much as I admire his dogs. Um, the, The Dachshund recently has gone through a period of change and I've been banging on for years that we were getting far too exaggerated. Unfortunately everybody in their show reports was writing long, low and level and I've always been one to say not too long, not too low and not too level and our standard has just recently been amended to um, well to give a better value to the dog really. Um, we, We want something with a bit of leg that can cover the ground and we don't want anything too long that it might have back troubles. And it's, it's to the good. I, 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 don't, I don't accept that the Kennel Club, with all their standard changes, have possibly been right on every breed. But um, in particular, the, Daxon, the new Dachshund breed standard is, is really good, in my opinion. And I hope it changes judges' ideas of the breed. So did you, did you have that outlook before the mass exposure? I, I did, unfortunately. I've been banging on for years because I, I judge abroad and I've seen the continental Dachshunds. Um, and in Germany, they have 35,000 members in the Dachshund Club, of which probably 90% are working people. Um, so they've got something to offer. How many of our Dachshunds that are sat on the floor with no leg could actually do anything? They can't run. They can't get down a hole. They've got a huge fore chest, too exaggerated. And, and a lot of breeds, especially perhaps you see some American breeds as well uh, that have gone the way of uh, exaggeration. And, and I think the Kennel Club are right to rein us in now. Michael. Well, from a personal perspective, I don't think um, I've always bred staying away from, from exaggeration because, you know, uh, as soon as you start to exaggerate a point, you lose out on other parts. You know, if... Uh, if you have a a hugely uh, there was American caucus years ago with hugely exaggerated back ends you know really sweeping um, stifles and and the same really with standard poodles and they look visually they look very good but when they move they can't move so um, you know I want something that flies around the ring and looks you know looks like a million dollars so uh, certainly that's not uh, exaggeration as as far as I see it is something that um, is to the detriment of the dogs that you, if you try to breed to win, it's at, it's at the detriment. And um, 
I feel that after spending all this time um, breeding dogs, <coughs> that our selection process, if we've run up against any problems, I think we've been lucky as well because we're a, a larger kennel, we're one of the bigger <coughs> breeders, and we've just removed them from the breeding um, program completely. And I think the difficulty lies with the s some smaller breeders. If they've got something very special and they arrive at a problem, then it's very difficult for them to sort of say, right, we, you know, we've just got to pack this in and start again with something fresh. Um, but I feel if you're strong, you've got to be strong because you've got to consider the future. And if you're coming up against a problem that is a serious issue, then I think everybody's, the desire is always to breed uh, good animals with long lives that have very, very good lives. And I think that if the kennel clubs start to implement and force changes to breeds, then I think that they're going against the good breeders in this country. And I, and I think that it, that is absolutely to detriment. I'll give you an example. Like this business with the peaks, with the long noses, right? <coughs> the Kennel Club wants to introduce this, uh, you know, a less exaggerated face and a, and a, and a longer fo a foreface on them. Now, I haven't had a great deal of experience, but in the past, as far as peaks are concerned, but all I know is that the two things that, uh, are, you know, the soft palates and the closed nostrils are things that can affect shorter for, uh, short breeds with shorter forefaces. And Shih Tzus that have like one inch long noses. When I was working for the Keto um, people when I was a kid, I saw soft palates and closed nostrils. Not, I mean, obviously they never bred from them, but the point was I saw puppies with those faults. They were pet owned, I mean, and, and they eradicated that. So what I'm <coughs> saying is it's not, what, the breeding stock has got to be healthy enough to breed from. Uh, like a peak with a flat face that's healthy, it's fine to breed from. If you breed them with a longer foreface, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be healthy. So leading on from that, um, it might be of interest to, to ask all, all four of you, what tests, if any, do you carry out on your own breeding stock? And, and for example, would you only use dogs that have been tested as appropriate for the breed? Harry? Right, tests. In <coughs> Wirehead Fox Terrier, some years ago, a small po a problem, not a small, but probably uh, ended up quite a big problem, arose in having heart problems. There was about, there, were, there was two in fact, there was another one called leg purse disease. Probably 15 to 20 years ago, that was reasonably prevalent. Seldom do we see that nowadays. The test for my dogs is every puppy, every single puppy that's reared, is tested for heart disease. And um, as far as uh, <coughs> leg purse disease, um, I haven't seen it. Certainly it hasn't been seen in Ireland, to my knowledge, and certainly not in show dogs, for about 20 years. It may be in the pet trade that may occur there, but certainly in show dogs, I haven't seen it. But every dog that I have is definitely tested for heart murmurs at a very young age. And did you um, health test the Salukis when you were more actively breeding? Well, fortunately, Salukis are not a breed that suffer um, from health uh, issues in general. There was a scare um, who I suppose it must be 20 years ago, where there were, uh, seemed to be quite a few dogs dropping dead, and they were concerned that there were probably heart problems, but it was never really <coughs> diagnosed and proved to be the case. Uh, however, we did have Dr. Brownlee at our championship shows who did do heart testing, and we did it on a voluntary basis, and I did have my bitches heart tested at that time. It wasn't foolproof, um, these tests that they can do in this way but um, most responsible breeders um, did have their stock heart tested and nothing really came from that. Mm. Michael what about your sort of screening regime for want of a better word? Um, well with the American Caucus obviously we don't breed from anything that's not eye tested. Um, interestingly in the States everything over there is hip scored um, it's not a, re uh, a requirement in the UK and I don't think it should be because typically 
whilst our breed has various constructional faults, um, even the worst ones get around the ring quite happily. You rarely see anything that's um, that's compromised as far as its movement's concerned. And then with the standard poodles, um, the requirements or the recommendations are for eye testing, SA testing and hip scoring. SA testing? That's yeah. sebaceous adenitis, uh, adenitis, it's a skin disorder. Okay. Well, uh, th we haven't ever experienced um, a case of sebaceous adenitis and by all accounts the test is only as good as the moment that it's done so two weeks later that might not be the you know that you, that if you if it's if it comes back and it's negative two weeks later it could be positive um so i don't really as far as these and and then we had the british veterinary association um the head panelist for the bvai scheme he comes once a year and does our, our you know we have a, a day where he's doing our dogs and we were having the standards done and in conversation I said to him, what problems exactly are there in standard poodles? And he said, oh, we haven't seen a problem for probably 20 years. So I thought, right, well, and that's the last time the standard poodles have been tested. And then finally, the hips. Um, again, you know, there's varying hip scores within our breed. But I'm yet to see a standard poodle of any, not just my own, but of anybody's that has any problems later in life with, you know, I mean, they're fantastic dogs, they're supremely fit, healthy animals. And at eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, they're still racing around, you know, being bloody lunatics. So, uh, you know, currently, unless I'm forced to, we don't hip score either. Zena, do you test? Well, there's nothing to test against in mini wires at the moment, mini wire Dax. Um, some of the other varieties have got eye problems and various things and the schemes of really well well they've sorted out the PRA virtually in in <coughs> mini longs at the moment and there's quite a lot of clear mating to clears but miniature wires they go on till they're 16 as an average age and are pretty healthy um, we have had a slight worry in the last few years that a couple of imports that have had mixed breeding behind them other coat breeding behind them have <coughs> brought in possibly uh, PRA and so I do insist that anything of certain lines that want to come to my dogs are screened for PRA first, and because I know all the British lines are totally clear of it. So apart from that, um, we don't have to we don't have to test for anything. All right, going back to the audience again, I think we've got a few more questions coming up from the gentleman in the middle. Hello, um, my name is Stuart Milner. I come from Solihull, West Midlands and my main breed are beagles. My question to the panel is, are you members of the Kennel Club accredited breeder scheme and what are your feelings on its introduction? Thank you. That should liven things up somewhat. <laughs> okay, um, Harry, um, are, you a, are you a member of the Kennel Club accredited breeder scheme? No, I'm not. No. You're not. Is that because of the geography? or The geography, do, yes. Does it extend to Ireland? It doesn't. Okay, <laughs> okay, right. So Happens. you don't get to speak on this one. No. Then. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when you were breeding, what, did, did we have the ABS then? No, I'm afraid you didn't. Okay, um, so it's over to you two then. <laughs> um, well... I'm, I'm not in the scheme. I may consider it, I think, when the Kennel Club have got to grips with some of the money breeders that are allowed to be members. Uh, and when they do and they cut them down to proper accredited breeders, then I would consider joining. Michael? Uh, I agree with Zena on that. I think that... Uh, My word. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. <laughs> um, the, the problem is that as... Zena's just suggested there are several people who are on the accredited breeder scheme which um, that are consistently producing poor quality animals and so there's no uh, it's not a benchmark for the quality that's being produced and therefore I don't think it's it's I don't think it's wise to be involved with it the other thing is that's kind of interesting is um, the woman who's made the papers just recently the St Bernard woman um, and all the drama that's gone along with that apparently she was an accredited breeder so I think that highlights that and one was one of the very first people and finally um, in principle you could test your American cockers 
for cataract, PRA and glaucoma and have them fail and then breed two failures together and you've met with the requirements to be an accredited breeder really? having, mm -hmm. uh, having absolutely guaranteed a litter of blind puppies so mm. I mean at the moment I think air it's of so scepticism I seem to feel on that particular question mm. but thank you Stuart <coughs> uh, another audience question please my name's Jill Peake from Lancashire I've bred beagles and shown them for many years quite successfully and I'm just wondering asking the panel when exporting a dog as a show prospect at what age would you be prepared to let such a dog go and be confident that this dog's going to achieve its potential? Thank you. Interesting question. Um, if I understand Jill, what she's saying, when exporting a dog as a show prospect, um, at what age would you be prepared to let that dog go confident that it will achieve its potential? Sounds like an Adonahue kind of question, this to me. <laughs> Mass exporter. I like to think it's 18 months. I like to think that by then the dog um, will have shown the progress that you require or that the new owner re would require. And uh, any before that, certainly in my breed, you might be taking a chance. But 18 months, um, he's not going to grow anymore. He's by then hopefully well trained for the show ring and he has shown promise. So I have sent many dogs abroad at 18 months, most of which have all become champions. So for me, the best time is about 18 months. Michael, and do, and do you think there's a, a breed specific thing possibly in this question? Yeah, I think to a degree. I mean, obviously the bigger the breed, I mean, you know, like a, a promising six month old Great Dane could be horrendous by the time it reaches full, yeah. full maturity, but, um, and. I mean, the problem is, it, it, it's a difficult one, really, because people, people want your bloodlines, perhaps, and there's always an issue, well, generally there's an issue, because, you know, people are trying to get um, new blood, for, and they don't want to pay a fortune for it, and if you do keep something till it's 18 months old, um, then, in particularly in the coated breeds, that the work is incredible, and the real value of that would mean that most people could not afford mm. to buy if they said to if somebody said to me we want to buy a standard poodle from you but we want you to run it until it's 18 months old <laughs> well I can't even begin to imagine how much I'd want to charge for that because <laughs> mm. the work the work is just incredible and I mean it kills us to try and maintain the ones that we're showing so I think that in the same way that um, in the same way that um, we all take risks when we buy a puppy in this country or or even by, you know when you breed a litter and and you select your puppy, there's risks involved. I think that if people are fully aware that um, they're going to get a, a puppy at a reasonable price at a younger age, I mean, I'd I'd have to say that I would want the breeds that I'm involved with to have changed the teeth. And and really, f five months old is not a difficult age to rear puppies to. Mm. You know, there, uh, there's a, a little element of having to make sure that everybody's socialised, and if you've got a lot, that that you know that can be very time-consuming. Um, but I think that five months old, mm. but there's a risk. I mean, I think Harry's completely right. At 18 months old, you've got more or less the finished product. Tying in with it, with this topic, actually, I think Edith Newton had a question that um, we could probably expand on here. Hello, I'm Edith Newton uh, from Chesterfield in Derbyshire. And I'd like to say to the panel, when you are selling a puppy that has clear show potential, are you prepared to sell such a puppy to a complete novice? And when you were breeding Salukis, would you be prepared to sell a really exciting show prospect into completely novice hands? Yes, that's the, that's the answer. Uh, provided, I mean, have provisos, provided on uh, the novice themselves, if they're prepared to take advice and um, basically they come back to me um, on a regular basis. I would want to follow the progress of the puppy. Um, yes, I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I have done on uh, more than one occasion <coughs> sold to a young person who has waited a time to come because they wanted particularly to have a puppy from me and um, they've done well with them. So yes, mm -hmm. it sounds. Zena. Um, Yes, I have. I have actually sold over 20 champions to 
first time mini wired accent and wolfhound owners. Um, so I'm perfectly prepared to let a good one uh, go. It's coming back to having a type in, in, in your litter that you've got more than one good puppy and you can't keep them all, especially Irish wolfhounds. And you're quite happy to, to help a new novice along the way. Um, just going back to the exporting, I, I would never export a puppy under six months. I think, as Mike said, teeth change is important. And would you really want a, a, a puppy under six months going through the hassle of several hours in a box and all the hassle of the airport? No, I wouldn't. And also, I think if you're exporting, you need to make sure I'd never ever sell a pet abroad, ever, because at some stage they're going to want to either breed, fr breed from it or show it. Um, so I've always got to be in my own mind certain that it is When you say you sell a pet abroad, you're <coughs> talking about a dog that in your estimation is pet quality. Yes, yes. I wouldn't do that. Not abroad. Mm -hmm. No. Michael? Um, Right, sorry, I just had to recap <laughs> on... Uh, He's having a but, senior moment. No, 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 it's because <laughs> with, the, the, with the subject chase there. Um, right, going back, novices, yeah, I, I mean, I feel really proud of the fact that we've sold over the years uh, quite a lot of dogs that have gone on to be, uh, you know, winners and champions for um, relatively new people in the breed. The only thing I would say is that um, if we were select... If, if, like, if we had a standard poodle litter with... Um, and there was, like, four show potential puppies then if somebody was keen to show, then I'd be keen to help them, but I wouldn't let them have the best of the litter. Because if they're brand new, the, the, the highly presented breed, I mean, you, you make so many mistakes when you first start showing dogs. I think that, they, that somebody has to have a dog that's of a certain quality that you feel um, proud that, that, you know, they're showing something that you've bred. Mm. But you know that they're gonna, I mean, you just know that they're going to make lots of mistakes with the trimming and, and allowing them to get matted, you know, because everybody's been there and done that. Um, so you only have to look back to when you first started yourself to know that there've been pro you probably had dogs then that had the, the potential to be great, which you, you, you c didn't, couldn't give them that opportunity, which mm -hmm. later. So, I mean, I feel that there's, there's, there, is, there has to be a level of, of uh, quality, but the very highest then in a coated breed, I would say no. Yeah. Now, Harry, have you had many novices in the past coming to you and saying, Mr. O'Donoghue, sell me a great one? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? Yes, in the beginning, but no, never again. Why is that? Well, the breed, like, something like uh, poodles of Mike, the breed I'm involved with is a hand strip breed that takes donkey's years to learn the trimming, to perfect the trimming. Now, let's suppose that someone gets a top-class puppy and they can't trim it. They go to the show on a regular basis and they can't win <coughs> it. Why? Because an inferior puppy that looks better and trim better, presented better, does the winning. That has happened to me many times in the past. Show potential puppies I will only sell to people who know how to trim. It's a waste of time otherwise. The dog is wasted. People give up after a while. They say, no, we can't win with this dog. And the chances are they can't win because they can't present it. And being a hand strip breed or a hand trim breed takes years to learn. So novices, and particular raw novices, people who like a picture of a dog and say, oh, I'd like to have one of those, and we want a top class one. I am very reluctant <coughs> now to sell a puppy to those people. I think yes. they must creep before they walk and they can get a, a lesser quality puppy and, and learn how to trim. Then they can come back and get one. So if you want a black tail wire, learn how to creep. <laughs> 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 Going back to um, your various sort of breeding principles, um, where do you stand on mating the closely related dogs, inbreeding, line breeding, what was the kennel strategy? Did you line breed? Did you outcross or whatever? Zena, do you like to kick off on with this one? Yeah, okay. Um, I've never mated father to daughter, mother to son, um, full brother and sister, but I have line bred quite closely over the years and um, 
I've always mated complementary types. I would never double up on a fault. And I think possibly sometimes to go back to the grandfather, if it was a great dog, unexaggerated, and, and it's given you a lot of uh, good progeny, then it's a super mating. Uh, I don't have any basic pr principle apart from the fact that I will not double up on faults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I found out very early on that <coughs> Um, in, in my first litter of mini wires, I doubled up on uh, two big ones, and it took about three, four generations to get the size down. Mm -hmm. So I think you, if you just keep away from the same fault in the mother and father, you probably do okay quite quickly. Did you breed fairly closely on with with the Salukis? I mean, I know you used overseas breeding at some point, but um, what what was your feeling on it? Well. Not really. The closest I would go would be half brother to half sister. Mm -hmm. um, what I did uh, do was I maintained um, my bitch line along the bottom of the pedigree. From the first bitch I had, it's been unbroken right through. Um, I felt by doing that, um, I could maintain the good qualities that I had in my bitch line. And like Zena, avoid fa doubling up on your faults at all mm -hmm. costs. Um, and uh, choosing dogs that um, compensate for the lacking, lack of quality in, in your own stock. Mm -hmm. um, basically, that's, that's how I went yeah, about yeah. it. Harry, did you have any sort of favourite matings? Yeah, no, something, something I'd like seen. I like half-brother, half-sister mating if, if there is no fault. Or, no, if there's counteracting faults. I don't mind that. I think that's a pretty good one. Um, we have our own little systems, but with the various lines that run, we have uh, bitches of one line that will suit a dog on the other line, and vice versa. That's the way it works with us. As all my dogs are related in some way. And the closest I ever went, and not purposely, was a mistake with a father to daughter mating about 25 years ago in Lakeland. And she was just one puppy. It was a mistake. It was a, we didn't know the female was in season at the time. She didn't show too well. And she had one puppy only. And that puppy was called Perfection. It was called Black to Perfection. Became a champion in a couple of countries very quickly. And it was a beautiful dog. It was only ever done once. And made me think that such a thing could happen. The dog was a real top class dog. Probably 40 years, maybe 25 years ago now, 25, 27 years ago. That's the only time that ever happened. But I am, uh, <coughs> I, my kennel is definitely line bred the whole way. So maybe nature does know best, going back to perfection, the Lakeland. Mike, how close would you go? Well, when I was very, very inexperienced, um, I did a father to daughter mating, it was disastrous. <laughs> and um, uh, it's interesting, really, because you know that the program that, that caused such fury. Um, I think one of the things that, it, I mean, I, you couldn't blame the Kennel Club for not, for not having it in the rules that we, that you, we couldn't do these fathers to Because I don't think it was something that people did. So I don't, it wasn't like a conscious decision to ha allow that. I think it was rather something that was overlooked not to allow it. And I regretted that breathing afterwards. And my advice to anybody, well, I can't, you can't do it now, I believe. Is that correct? Mm. Well, no, I mean... Not as, not as close <coughs> as that. As no, I but I mean, uh, and the, but as far as... Uh, uh, you know, like grandfather, granddaughters, and half brother, half sister breedings. Fine, providing y you are quite sure that there's no like nasties hanging around in the in the background. Mm. Interesting. Pa uh, may I just butt in on that on, on the um, actual part if we're going into outcrossing, um, which I think all line bred kennels have to do, not perhaps on a regular basis, but certainly now and then. I think you will also bring in as much bad bad points as you have good, and it sometimes takes you four generations to get out, and you suddenly think at the end of the day, why have I done this? Sure. Just purely to get another, a bigger genetic gene pool in. Mm. Um, you've bought in all these other things that have been hidden sure. in your dogs. Yeah. 
Well, time is marching on, and um, one thing I'd like to ask you all um, before we start closing down, as it were, is when you did um, begin your careers as, as breeders, uh, did you have a mentor or mentors in particular, uh, someone that gave you inspiration, who taught you? And the question has a second sort of edge to it, and that is, do you yourselves find that you are able or inclined to mentor new up-and-coming breeders. Mr. Donahue, did you have a mentor? I had one um, who was on the verge of retirement when I started, in the name of Alec Barrett, who was the top fox terrier man in Ireland at the time. And uh, he did help. The problem was he lived 70 miles from where I lived. And the only way to get there was three buses. If you can imagine 1953, uh, things were, there wasn't as many cars on the road then. And we had, uh, we have a few more cars in Ireland now, but then there were very few, and you would travel by bus or train. And to drag a dog on the train or on the bus was a big affair. Nevertheless, I would visit him, and he was at that time my mentor, and did teach me quite a bit about fox terriers. Um, he's the only one. Oh yes, there was one other one. Was a, um, a gentleman from Northern Ireland, who was a mentor not in in the terrier breed, but when I started to judge, and he was a blind person. I've told the story before, but he was blind. From mentored by a blind judge. Yes, <laughs> there's a paragraph but, but there somewhere. He, he gave me some advice which I use to this day. He was uh, he was blinded by uh, a disease when he was nine years old, and now he's a very old man. And he was a rather difficult man. And he said to me when I first started judging, he says, "O'Donoghue, I hear you're starting to judge." That's right. So he said, uh, well, tell me what you do when you, when you get a dog in the ring. I said, I look at him, try to assess how good the dog is against the standard and so on, so on, so on. I went all through this. Oh, he says, you're all wrong. Oh, why am I wrong? Well, he said, uh, what do you do when you get the dog on the table? I examine him, I said, I go all over him and all the rest of it. Hmm. Well, he says, suppose you have two dogs in the ring, you can't decide which is the better one, what do you do then? I don't know, I said, I'm in trouble, like everybody else is in trouble. I, I do my best, at, he says, let your hands tell you what to do. When you're picking a puppy, he says, if there's two puppies on the table and you can't decide which one is the one you keep, Close your eyes and let your hands tell you. And let your fingers tell you, particularly your fingers, he says. Your fingers will tell you where the shoulders are. Your fingers will tell you the length of the body. Your fingers will tell you the width of the head. Your fingers will tell you everything, he says. And your eyes will deceive you, but your fingers never will. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you see Harry going around with his eyes shut, you know exactly <laughs> what he's Did you have a mentor, Anne? <coughs> yes, I did. Um, Hope Waters, whom I got my first saluki from, the Berry yeah. Down Kennel, she was absolutely wonderful to me. Um, I used to go down and stay with her when I was showing in the south and maybe spend a weekend. She was tremendously critical of her own dogs. She would point out the faults in her own stock. We used to look at puppies and she would say, which one do you think you would like? And she would say, well, I think that one's the best for this reason and she was immensely helpful to me. She knew, um, she had seen and judged most of the dogs that were in my first bitch's pedigree. Um, I had seen photographs, of course. She could tell me what they were actually like. Um, she had written extensively about the breed. She told me, you know, all about the history of the breed and where the faults lie. She told me about the other breeders. Um, we had many an amusing tale about things that happened at dog shows and claims that some of her um, competitors had made. Um, so really, um, if I had a problem at all, 
I just needed to lift the phone. And she so she was up. always there for you? She was. Which yes. is good. Now, Zena. Absolutely. I, I mostly taught myself um, through books, but I did have in Irish Wolfhounds one great mentor in Mrs. Nagel who was tremendously helpful. She had a rather plain type of Irish Wolfhound, fantastically strong, f- fabulous construction. And if you were in a forest and there was a wolf with you, you'd want one of Mrs. Nagel's dogs with, her, with you. And that's the way I learned from her. Um, Percy Whitaker ta- taught me about shoulders because they were always a bit of a mystery to me for the first year or two, which was brilliant. And I'm still learning now. I mean, I, I remember not recently we were at a show, Harry, and um, I got this problem with my breeding canaries. And we had a long, long conversation about what I was doing wrong. And he eventually told me to give her one last chance. And if not, just sell her. No good. Start again. So you can, all, you can always learn from everybody. And I think the second part of your question is about uh, new breeders. I, I'm always willing to help them, but I don't know that they're often willing to listen. Mm-hmm. I agree about that. Michael, anyone <coughs> prepared to listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> Are you joking? They have to listen. Um, well, as far as the first part of the question is concerned, uh, mentors, I was, I mean, my involvement in dogs started uh, as a result of a weekend job with a, a lady called Lorna Island who had Arandora Pyrenees. She was quite um, a forceful character and, um, and she taught me a, a great deal and, and we used to go to the shows and, and uh, I was allowed, we'd arrive at the shows, the dogs would be put on the benches I'd allowed like 10 minutes before we got started to have a quick look round and then um, and then I'd sit on the benches all day. Lunch time, there was, in those days there was normally a break for lunch and uh, between the dog and the bitch judging and then I was allowed to go off for an hour and then I'd sit on the benches all afternoon and then we'd come home. And uh, times change. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and then so she was like Pyrenean, so it was like all about feeding and exercise and the importance of like, you know, main, you know maintaining mental condition as well as the physical condition, which is, a, 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 which going back to earlier questions, you know, mental condition, everybody's with coated breeds in particular, all concerned about the coat, but you can't have dogs that go into the ring looking fabulous unless, you know, mentally that you've conditioned them too. But Ellen Johnson taught me coats. That was the very famous Kitor Shih Tzu lady. Uh, but, and then... As far as me being a mentor, um, I think I'm, I'm really quite proud that some of the people that I've, um, I've had uh, involvement with have gone on to become, um, you know, very successful in their own right. And I can't, one of the things I can't do is be nice. I find nice quite difficult, really. Um, <laughs> But you know, I would it, never have known. <laughs> I mean, the people who I think who've perhaps taken on board some of my advice that may or may not have been beneficial to them, have, have, they've never been. Uh, it's never been delivered in a in a wrapped up sugar sweet manner. It's always been very brutal. Brutal. So, and I think that that's sometimes you know because it's not. I mean, people novices perhaps will have a new puppy and I think it's wonderful. And if it's not wonderful, it's no use. You know, it, it's no use trying to pretend it's anything other than what it is. Sure. So. so they've got to take it. Yes, absolutely. Or exit the arena. <laughs> <laughs> well, time is marching on. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to finish now. So I think we will learn a lot today from our distinguished panel. Dedication, care and attention to detail play a major role in becoming a world-class breeder. It's clear how even the most experienced of us always has something to learn, how we breed, rear, feed and manage our kennels and dogs. Breeding world-class dogs is a combination of instinct, science, premium high-quality nutrition, and experience and I think we've learned that there's no substitute from learning from the experts whether you're experienced or a novice and as our panel members have aptly demonstrated today 
world-class breeders are always happy to advise and help. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Anne, to Harry, to Mike and Zena. And finally, I'd like to thank our audience and our sponsors, Yukonuva and Dog World. And you will be able to follow the Breeders Masterclasses at breeders.yukonuva.co.uk and of course at dogworld.co.uk. So for the time being, thank you all for attending and thank you for being so, for so attentive.